me an email. All right, so it's uh, right at nine o'clock, so I won't waste any more time, Paul. Uh, you, you have the floor, sir. <clears throat> yep, thank you, Dave. So uh, just real quick uh, recap on my introduction. Once again, Paul Ramsberg, um, I sat as chair on a, on a quality assurance committee at PCI, and I, I'm a voting member of the Quality Assurance Council and a few other committees. But besides that, I'm the district manager for SICA Admixtures based out of Georgia. And assisting me today is uh, Mr. Billy Dickens, who's a district manager for SICA Admixtures based in Florida. And uh, he's going to give some of the Florida perspective. So he may be popping in and out of the conversation as I go along. And I encourage Billy. I tend to talk fast, especially in the short amount of time we have to present this information. So feel free to jump in and stop me anytime. And then bear with me and I'll start sharing the screen. Just to confirm, you can see this? Yes, let's both. Thank, Thank you. Okay, so we'll pick up where we left off yesterday. And I briefly touched on um, how to determine if your mix design is averaging the right amount of compressive strength. What is the right amount, right? It can't average the design strength. If your design strength is 7,000, it can't be the average or half your brakes would be less than that. So uh, we need to uh, figure out how much over design we need in our mix. So that's where we're gonna start at 9 a.m. Some information on basic statistical analysis um, to our concrete performance. What we're gonna cover is the, um, how to calculate an average. I know that's very basic, the range, but we need those two pieces of information to go on to calculate the standard deviation of the compressive strength of our concrete mix design. And then how to use that standard deviation for um, mix design approval, submittals, but also the evaluation and acceptance of our mix design internal. Let's jump right into the math. So calculating average, we all know how to do this, but I wanted to put the equation there so you're not so intimidated by, uh, by the equations you'll see when we get the standard deviation, right? So uh, average is pretty simple. We, uh, it's the sum of all the individual tests divided by the number of tests itself. So here's an example. Here's seven tests right here. So we see the individual test uh, data. We add all those up uh, across the bottom line. We see that information divided by the number of tests. In this case, it's seven. So the average here is 7,264 PSI compressors. Pretty basic. How do we calculate range? Well, we uh, we take our maximum compressive strength, subtract our minimum compressive strength from those test points, and that gives us a range of 950 psi for the seven test um, sample um, set. So now here's a point. Don't be intimidated by that's the. Equation four, standard deviation. So uh, the deviations, that's the difference from the average of each of the individual test points, and of course, squared in sum. So we're gonna walk through this. Now you'll have this presentation in PDF form like we just discussed. You can go back and review this at any time. We're gonna walk through this equation line by line. So we're gonna start with the top line there, the sum of the average, individual results minus the average squared. Let's go through that. So we'll break that down step by step. So here we have six individual tests. You see them on the far left. Um, and so they, we see the average, the average of those six individual tests is 8,677. So we have the individual test point minus the average gives us this deviation. Now it might be a negative or a positive number that doesn't matter. We have that step, that's the XI minus X. The individual test point minus the average gives us that information. Now all we gotta do is square that. So for instance, the top line, negative 327 times negative 327 equals positive 106,929. 
So we, all we do is go across and square each row. And of course, a negative times a negative is always a positive. So we have our positive numbers in the far right column. Now you'll notice at the bottom, we sum all those up. So this, what's happening here in this chart is that top line of this equation, right? The sum of the uh, individual points minus a negative square. So that's done in this step. Pretty simple. Now I'm only doing it on six test points to make the math simpler on this presentation. But of course, you're going to have more than six test points when, when you actually monitor your mixed design. So we get the number of this top line of 671,734, as we see in the total line. Now we're going to move on to the next line of this equation, the bottom line under that. So it's our first top line number. 671, 734, divided by n minus one. So n is the number of tests. So here it's six, we had six tests. So six minus one is five. So it's as simple as 671, 734, divided by five, which gives us 134, 346. And now we just figure out the square root of that number and it gives us 367. So our standard deviation is 367. That's how much we can expect our each individual mix to deviate from the average of the compressive strength. So fairly simple test procedure. So you ask, wow, that's a lot of math. And it is. I took um, the National Ready Mix Concrete Association, uh, what they call level three short course, um, one of the toughest tests in concrete, I think. And uh, in there, when I took it years ago, uh, you had to calculate standard deviation of 30 tests by hand as part of the test. It's a lot of work to do, a lot of math to take care of. And you're gonna ask, why can't I use a spreadsheet? And of course, my answer always is yes, use an Excel spreadsheet. Um, you don't have one, don't worry about it. I'm gonna give you one. It's one of the giveaways or the handouts to this course. And I'm gonna show it to you at the end of this um, portion of the presentation. We'll show you how to, some more about standard deviation, um, what impacts it and how it impacts your um, operation. But I just wanted to get the basics of the math down so you understand what's happening in the spreadsheet later. So how to use this for mixed design approval? How do we approve uh, out a mix to get approval for that mix? Well, there's uh, for the cemental process, there's three ways that we can uh, prove out our mixed design. And uh, one is the strength data from somewhere between 10 and 30 consecutive test points. And then we figure out the standard deviation based on those test points. Now, if you have as little as 10 or 15 test points, um, there is a safety factor involved, which I'll show you the chart for. And that safety factor makes it difficult to, um, to optimize a mix. It's going to mean you have to average a lot more than you would if you had 30 test points. So as a standard, if you can get 30 individual test points, um, then uh, you'll be able to calculate the best possible standard deviation without that safety factor and, and get the lowest design strength or required design strength. Now, the second way is laboratory trial batches, and we can conduct those in accordance with ASTM C192. So uh, if we don't have any testing that we can uh, lean on from a production practice, then we'll do these laboratory test batches, and you can look up ASTM C192 in full of it. The third way is a three-point curve. This is trial testing. And a three-point curve will We'll uh, have three batches of concrete. We have to maintain a slump of plus or minus three quarter inch and air time plus or minus half inch. So it's harder than it sounds, I know. And then in doing so, we also range the water cement ratio. So we have a target water cement ratio, one a little higher and one a little lower. And then if all those three points exceed our average, or exceed our design strength, then, uh, then we can uh, submit that mix for approval. So, uh, the uh, the listing there, the strength data of 30 consecutive tests, that's obviously the most uh, reliable means of proving out a mix. So I'm gonna read through some of this. This is, uh, this is important information um, as per AS ACI 318, our design code. So this allows for the revision of a concrete mix or the optimizing of your mix. If you have one already, you can revise that mix. And it, as long as it's proven consistently um, over strength tests. So we get consistent strength, high strengths and we can optimize that mix. What we need is a sufficient uh, number of tests 
and then we figure out the statistical significant data um, showing our standard deviation and the reliability of our mix. And then we can uh, um, optimize a mix from there based on that overstrain. So we need at least 15 test points. 30 is recommended, that's considered the standard. Now a test point is, if you're using a four by eight cylinder, a test point is three cylinders. So ACI 318, and we all know this by now, requires you to use an average of three four by eight cylinders to get your 28 day test point. The, uh, and then the standard deviation, we calculate that. And then there's a couple features it has to meet and here we are. So this is from ACI 318. And uh, we have to meet the best of these. Now we're not gonna consider less than 5,000 PSI because I doubt any of you on here are designing concrete under 5,000 PSI. So we look to the bottom of this page, the 5,000 PSI design strength or greater. And then we have two calculations. Your F prime CR, that's your required compressive strength, equals the F prime C, your design strength, plus 1.34 times your standard deviation. That's a little symbol on the right end. And then you also have to figure the 90% uh, of your design strength plus 2.33 times your standard deviation. We do both these calculations. And then we, uh, whichever has the larger value, we, our average has to exceed that number. I know it sounds a little confusing. We're gonna, I'll show you in the Excel spreadsheet, and we'll be a little clearer. So if we have less than 15 tests available, we'll look at this top chart. We don't have our 15 tests or, or greater. Over 5,000 PSI on the bottom row there, our mix has to be 110% of our design strength plus 700 PSI. So we have a 7,000 PSI design strength without more than 15 tests to rely on, then would have to be 8,400 PSI would have to be our average. Now, if we have more than 15 test points, we can use the standard deviation from them to optimize our mix and, and bring down that required strength. Now, if we have 15 test points, we see the modified standard deviation. Now, 30 test points, we don't have to modify our standard deviation at all, and it allows us to optimize our mix to a greater extent. Before I share the Excel spreadsheet, um, one more uh, point on evaluation and acceptance of the mix, All right? So uh, just a point from PCI, MNL 116 and 117 is all your test specimens need to be made in accordance with these standards. Those uh, manuals point you to the ASTM standard. So the strengths of the mixture shall be reported and must satisfy the following two criteria. So in order for your mix to be um, an approved mix, not the individual test point to be acceptable for that product, but for your mix design to be an approved mix design it has to meet these two standards. The average of all the sets of three consecutive strength tests need to equal or exceed the specified strength test. This is called a moving three average. So we take three tests, maybe uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and then we average those three together and that has to exceed the specified strength. Um, now, if we had a 7,000 PSI specified strength and we had uh, the test yesterday was 7,500, the test today was 7,800, the test tomorrow is 6,900. 6, One individual test is under strength, but the average of those three still exceeds the design strength. So that individual test from that individual product may not be acceptable. That's, up, that's between you and your project documents. But according to ACI and PCI in turn, that's an acceptable mix design still. There can be low strength points and still be an acceptable mix still. But also look at number two, no single strength test. That's the average of the three cylinders, four by eight cylinders at 28 days, right? No single strength test should fall below the specified strength by more than 500 PSI if our design strength is over 5,000. I'm sorry, is, uh, is lower than 5,000. If it's uh, more than 5,000, then it's 10% of the F prime. So we can't lose more than 10% of our design strength on any given point um, 
and still be an acceptable mix design. So if you have a 7,000 PSI mix design and you have a single test point that only comes back at 5,000 PSI, that's below that 10%. So your mix design needs to be adjusted. There's something wrong with the mix. Now, maybe you identify something was wrong with the material that went into it or a proportion or a mistake was made. That's one thing. But if our mix on a performance basis has a single test point that falls below 10% of our design strength, we need to reevaluate that mix. That mix design is no longer um, acceptable. If we can't identify some major mistake that it. So I'm going to stop this for now, and I'm going to pull up another another uh, spreadsheet here to show you. Here's the uh, spreadsheet that goes along with this course for calculating standard deviation. Now, this is very much a teaching spreadsheet. You know, if you see my arrow there in the column uh, K and L, that's stuff that normally would be hidden on an Excel spreadsheet, but it's, it's highlighted here so you can see the steps in the process. On uh, column A, you see the dates of our individual test points. Column B, C, and D, you see the uh, three individual cylinders. And then column E, you see the average of those three. So the column E is our individual test point, average of three cylinders. And then uh, of course the math is shown over on the right-hand side, column K and L. Now I'll scroll down a little and you see there's a there's place for 30 test points. So this sheet allows for 30 individual test points. If you, uh, Want to do more than 30, you can add to the sheet or you can just recalculate every 30 points on this sheet. At the bottom of the column E, you see the average of all of the averages. Now that we also see uh, down here in line uh, 42 and below, this is that table where we have to adjust our, uh, our uh, standard deviation if we don't have 30 test points. But for the, today's discussion, we're going to assume you have 30 test points. You see up here, 30 test points, so the modifier is just one. Our standard deviation calculated here is 181 PSI. Well, that's a really tight standard deviation. I've never seen one that good in real life. So whoever's producing concrete here is doing a great job of being consistent. Now, we see here in columns H and I, rows uh, 15 through 17, there's our two equations from ACI 318. So equation one, equation two, we see the numbers. Equation one is a higher number, so we have to follow that equation. And then our actual average is 7,563. And yes, it exceeds the required 7,242. So this mix design um, is good. This looks great. Our average is exceeding the requirement based on our standard deviation. But there's a lot of things that affect these individual test points. A lot of things can... Uh, go wrong in a plant, a lot of things can go right in a plant and uh, give us some very high numbers. Let's look at that. So most of my uh, numbers to average this low amount are um, they're doing pretty good. I'm not exceeding that 7,000 by much. So uh, I'm gonna go through and I'm just gonna mess up the sheet by entering some data. Just give me instead of 7,700, let's do a couple of 9,000 PSI averages. So I'm just gonna for the sake of time, I'm just gonna put in a few. Exactly 9,000. And we'll put in some lower ones too. Maybe some ones that just hit 7,000. Oh, I threw a number way off. <laughs> So here I threw in, let's see, I threw in six strength points out of the 30 that were 9,000 PSI, 2,000 high. That's great. And I threw in one, two, three, four that barely made strength, 7,000. So all these individual test points on the individual products, great. The, the products all pass, they all meet or exceed the requirement. But look what they did to your standard deviation. Now your actual average is 7,777. 
what you required by the standard is 7,892. Now with a couple barely minimum strengths and a few exceedingly uh, high strengths, you threw your standard deviation off and the mix no longer is acceptable by ACI B18 standards. So the idea of controlling your standard deviation is, is controlling the consistency of your strength results, both high strength results and low strength. So who impacts this? Who impacts the consistency of your concrete in your plant? I'd say absolutely everybody. Everybody in your facility impacts this. How about the loader operator who's loading your sand up and gives you um, inconsistent slumps because his practices, he isn't following standard practice, yeah? That guy's affecting your compressor strength results, highs and lows. How about uh, the guy moving form parts in and out of a shop? Is, uh, is he affecting it? Well, if he moves a form part and sets it in front of a concrete truck or, or delivery system, the concrete sets too long in the, in the bash plan or in the system without being poured, and you know, maybe you get a little higher or a little low strength. Um, everybody that comes in contact with your concrete is going to affect the consistency of that compressor strength and therefore impact your standard deviation and therefore impact the cost of your concrete. Because every point of PCI, or every point of uh, PSI strength above your design costs you money. So if we can have the tightest possible standard deviation, we can optimize our mixes to be as inexpensive as possible. So there's, there's the practical impact of standard deviation and understanding your standard deviation. So you'll have a copy of that spreadsheet. Feel free to make use of it. I encourage you, if you don't already have one in your plant, Go ahead and take that one and enter your last 30 test points and at least understand what standard deviation is, how controlled your concrete is. So give me one second and we'll start this next module. Okay, we're gonna talk about durability of concrete. There we go. So what is durable concrete, right? It's, uh, Durability of concrete is defined as the ability of the concrete to resist weathering action, uh, chemical attack, and abrasion while maintaining its desired engineering properties for, for the amount of time specified. So if I have a um, if I have a project that needs a, let's say a box culvert or a manhole, the project's only going to be around 20 years, so it has a 20-year service life. Now, we put that box culvert in place and 25 years later, it starts deteriorating and cracking and falling apart. Is that 25-year-old concrete durable? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is because it maintained the service five years longer than the specified uh, service life. So it was durable, right? It met those engineering properties for the amount of time specified. In turn, if I have a 100-year service life on a bridge and 75 years into the concrete's life, it starts to deteriorate, is that 75-year-old concrete durable? No, no, it's not because it was intended to be a 100-year service life. So durability really um, depends on the service life design, but it's the ability of the concrete to withstand um, exterior forces and interior forces um, at play for the life of that concrete. So we're gonna go through some basic concerns on durability. This is by no means all the things you should understand about the durability of concrete. We're just gonna go through a few of the top things um, that uh, someone getting started should be aware of. And the first we'll start with is alkali silica reaction. There's also alkali carbonate reaction. Both of those together, we'd call it alkali aggregate reaction. We're gonna focus on alkali silica reaction. So this is a type of deterioration that happens inside the concrete. And it occurs when uh, acryl, active mineral components of some of the aggregates, reactive silica in some aggregates, they react with the um, alkali hydroxides in the concrete. So in order for ASR to occur, we need higher alkalis from our cementitious materials, maybe a cement with above a 0.60 alkalinity, as we covered in our mill cert section. Now, in Florida, that might be not be super critical. Most of your um, Native American cements in the Southeast are low alkali, though if you're getting a foreign cement, you should be aware a lot of foreign cements are higher alkali. Um, we also need aggregate containing a reactive silica 
uh, material. So are, are aggregates potentially reactive? How do we know? Well, PCI requires you to understand that about your aggregate. You need to have test results from either C295 or ASTM C1260. Um, PCI requires that on every aggregate you use. So if you're in an architectural plant and you have 15 different aggregates and all the aesthetic um, mixes you have, well, you need these tests on all 15 aggregates. You need to understand, are they potentially reactive? Now, just because they're potentially reactive doesn't mean you can't use them. You need to understand whether they are or are not. That doesn't mean you yourself have to do this test, but it has to be done on your aggregate. So if you're buying aggregate from a bro broker, like the architectural producers may, they might have this result uh, in, in house. If uh, you're purchasing directly from the quarry, then uh, the quarry might have this information. And if your aggregates on the PQL um, for the DOT, then more than likely this test data is, is already on there. But you have to have, be aware of this in your facility. And then also the third uh, thing that has to be present is moisture inside your concrete. And not in your plastic concrete, but in the hardened concrete in its final state, there has to be a continual presence of moisture before that alkali and silica can react. So if we know the three things necessary, and all three, three has to be in place. So we know the three components that have to be there before this to occur, then we know how to prevent it, right? If we know how to cause it, we can prevent it. So preventions of ASR, we can use a uh, total cementitious alkalized below 0.60. Notice I mentioned total cementitious alkali. So maybe we have a higher alkali cement and we blend it with a slag or fly ash or some other material that has lower alkalis and it brings our total alkalinity of our powder down. Um, of course, as I just mentioned, we can use supplementary cementitious materials, fly ash, silica fume, metacalin, slag, and they'll mitigate this uh, property. And then of course we can choose non-reactive aggregates. If we have to use a high alkali powder, then we need to make sure our aggregates are non-reactive. I think of more importance to understand in precast pre-stress than ASR is DEF, delayed etringite formation. This impacts more people around the country than ASR does. ASR typically is spotty based on the aggregate types in various regions of the country. Anybody in precast pre-stress is going to have to deal with delayed etrogate formation. So what is DEF? Well, as our cement particles hydrate when they're blended with water in our plastic concrete, then some uh, they, they transform from those four basic compounds that make up cement, remember uh, tricalcium silicate and dicalcium silicate and on and on. Um, they uh, combine with water, it's a hydraulic cement, and they turn into a chemical compound, calcium silicate hydrate. Well, in that process, a, a mineral known as etringite comes into existence. Now in a perfect world, all the etringite would come into existence and then be consumed in that process and then no longer be present in the hardened concrete. But because of different curing methods or lack of curing methods, some etringite can either uh, remain during the hydration process, remain over, or it could uh, form in a delayed state. And then when water combines with that etringite in the future, it creates an expansive gel that puts force on the concrete from inside and creates cracking. A lot of times when you may have driven by bridge abutments, a train bridge abutment maybe, the mass concreting and you see cracking with a bunch of white stuff pouring out. Uh, typically we've always in the past said that's ASR and that's kind of what ASR looks like. But when we do a mass concrete where there is high heat of hydration, that's most likely delayed etrogate formation. We're looking at. And that can happen in precast pieces too. So what do we need for that to occur? Well, typically it's the heat of our early curing that uh, would cause this. So PCI has requirement for your uh, curing to um, for limits on your curing, right? You can't cure, uh, ramp up your heat faster than a certain amount. You can't uh, exceed a certain um, amount of heat over your uh, over the course of your accelerated curing, and uh, ACI limits that to 160. Well, PCI put down if you're using a straight mix design, your internal concrete temperature should not exceed 158, is what the PCI standard is. And notice that's internal concrete temperature, not the heat of the steam around your piece under the tarp, but inside the concrete. That's for a straight cement mix design. 
if uh, if you use a SCM like slag or fly ash, ACI says you can go up to 210 degrees Fahrenheit internal concrete temperature because those SCMs mitigate delayed entry and formation. So how do we prevent it? We can use sound and proven materials, really good strong aggregate. We can cure below 158 after our, after our initial set or if we're using an SCM, we can go much higher. And of course, use those uh, SCMs to mitigate that reformation of, of etringite. There's the issue of sulfate attack. So sulfates exist in groundwater, um, exist in soils. I think there's quite a bit of sulfates around Florida. And uh, these can destroy the concrete. They attack the concrete from outside and deteriorate it over time. So how do we protect our concrete from sulfates? Well, we can design with a low water smear ratio. The lower water smear ratio, the less likely sulfates are to get inside our concrete. We can use a type two cement or a low alkali cement. And then we can use those SCMs of slag or fly ash or medicalin or any other SCM. These will mitigate that process. How about that of freeze thaw? We talked about why we use air entrainment in the admixture material section. Um, air entrainment is to prevent freeze thaw damage inside of your concrete. And uh, those two boxes on the right, remember the illustration we had yesterday. So how can we prevent air entrainment? I mean, how can we prevent freeze thaw? Well, the correct air entrainment um, uh, specified will help prevent that. So it depends on how aggressive of a freeze thaw zone we're in. You in Florida, you're not. North Florida, you're in a, a mild freeze thaw zone. Central South Florida, you're not in one at all. So you may not see very much air entrained concrete down there. It might be on a specification. But the key to understanding air entrainment is not just the total air required, 5%, 6%, or whatever it may be, but we need to understand the spacing factor and specific surface area as well. So this is the air void analysis. Spacing factor, how far apart or close together are, are our air voids? They need to be uh, um, less than 0 0.008 inches. And then our specific surface area is an indication of the size of the air bubble. So we want small bubbles spaced evenly um, together. This you can't measure in your plant. If uh, we need to understand this for a project, we're gonna have to get outside testing to do this for us. Notice this point on prevention of freeze thaw damage. Um, fly ash, slag, silica fume should not exceed 25%, 50% or 10% respectively. Up to this point, for every durability factor and about strength, we've been saying to increase the use of SDM, high percentage replacement of SDM. When freeze thaw comes into play, then we have limits on how much of these in SCMs we can use. Very high content SCMs may give us issues with freeze thaw damage, maybe. Here's an example of air void analysis. Um, these two samples both have roughly about five and a half percent air content. We can visualize on this air void analysis. The sample on the left has a lot of irregular large bubbles with a lot of concrete that's not protected from freeze thaw. The five and a half percent air on the right, a lot of small evenly spaced bubbles that protects the entire surface. Let's talk permeability. This affects every attribute of durability of concrete. The less permeable, the less water our concrete can absorb, the longer the service life of our concrete will be. Right? So only improve every aspect of durability to have a more dense, less permeable concrete. So permeability is a function of the permeability of the, the paste itself, the permeability of the aggregate uh, itself, gradation of the aggregate affects permeability, the void structure between the stone, right? Um, the quality of that paste and aggregate transition zone. So um, Paste that bonds to a textured surface of an aggregate will create a you know, less permeable concrete. So uh, how can we decrease the permeability of our concrete? Well, lowering the water smear ratio. The, less, the lower the water smear ratio, the less permeable our concrete will be, the less water it can absorb. And then we need, need to use a uniform, well-graded aggregate. Um, it creates less void structure between the stone and sand particles. And then, of course, use an SCM, slag, fly ash, silica fume, medicalin, natural pozzolans. These all improve the permeability of our concrete. 
or density of our pond. Here's a visual example. Here's two concretes. They both have the exact same amount of cement sandstone. The mix design is exactly the same, except for two things. The sample on the left, and the magnification is the same on both as well. The sample on the left is a water cement ratio of a 0 0.50. And the sample on the right has a water cement ratio of a 0.36. On the sample to the left of the high water content, we can really see the crystals formed on the cement particles. And look at all the space and gap between them. So there's a lot of voids in here for water to transmit into the concrete. And when water enters our concrete, it brings everything nasty like sulfates with it that can deteriorate our concrete. Also water gets through there. It can interact with any ettringite that's allowed to remain during hydration or silica and um, alkalize uh, to blend and create alkali silica reactivity. But the sample on the right is very dense, right? No water is getting through that. And the only difference to create that density was a lower water cement ratio. And we won't go through all these tests, but the, a list of tests that as working in quality control and mixed design and a pre-stress plan, you should be familiar with these requirements uh, that you may see in project documents, or at least the methods in which to test concrete for these durability factors. All right, so we've gone through durability. Let me take another 30 second um, coffee break here, and we'll start self-consolidating. So what is self-consolidating concrete? I like this definition here. A highly flowable yet stable concrete that spreads readily into place, fills the formwork without any consolidation, without undergoing significant separation. See the factors played out there? It's flowable, it um, encapsulates the rebar, fills the formwork, doesn't need vibration or much vibration at all, doesn't ex uh, experience segregation. That's the factors we need. Um, that picture there on the right is a picture I took in a plant back in 1999, the early days of SCC here in America. Somebody had dropped their Nokia phone in the form, little wood form setup that took three days to set up. No one was taking that form apart to get that phone. We we cast SDC and the phone floated up against the formwork. The next day we, we dialed the number of the guy who dropped the phone, just goofing on him. And it rang, you know, it's Nokia, possibly the best phone ever made. It rang inside the concrete and you see the hammer marks. We chipped that phone out. And the reason I love this picture is in, in, if you look close enough in the picture and you blow it up, the SEC so perfectly encapsul encapsulates all the detail. You can see the numbers on the keypads on this cell. Oh, it's excellent. And that phone worked until the battery died. The battery charging port was filled with concrete. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on how to do SEC testing. I think all of us have seen it and have you've probably even done SEC testing. I'll go over a few points just to show how we can use one test in particular to predict the issues in our plant if we're having or need to troubleshoot some issues. These are the tests required by PCI for you to qualify your mix. You have to uh, determine the slump flow range that's acceptable for your mix design. The T20 range, I'll show you what the T20 is if you don't know. Of course, air, the visual stability index, you have to conduct the J ring, the column segregation, and the penetration segregation device. You have to do both segregation um, tests in order to qualify your SCC mix. This is PCI standard. PCI has a document you can download from the website or ask Ross Bryan when they come do the audit in your plan. They'll give you a copy of it. They have a mixed qualification document that uh, shows you the frequency in which you have to conduct these tests to qualify a mix. And the document also shows you the frequency you have to conduct these tests as regular QC tests. So this is a slump uh, cone in the procedure B of inverted slump cone. And we see our rings on there. I wanna tell you a little about the T20. So the T20, we time our flow to the point of the 20 inch mark. So our, our flow boards need to have a 20 inch mark on them. And then we uh, press start on our stopwatch as soon as we lift the cone and stop it when, as soon as the flow hits the 20 inch mark. See in the bottom left hand, 
we have a T20 of 2.63 seconds. So PCI requires you to do this twice per mix design per month. So twice per mix design per month. Um, I usually tell all my uh, people I work with, do T20 Tuesdays. Because every Tuesday, do T20s on your flow. If you're not going to conduct them all the time. And that, that pretty much hits and exceeds um, all the requirements from PCI to gather your data. Now, I will purport you should be doing the T20 every single time you do a slump flow test. But that test is as critical, if not more critical, than the slump flow test. So in the past, we've always thought about concrete from a standpoint of workability, which is a one-dimensional concept, right? High slump, low slump, workability, just along one axis, high slump, low slump, the one-dimensional thinking, concrete workability. But with SCC, we need to consider the rheology of SCC as a fluid. So we need to think in two dimensions, right? Two-dimensional concepts of, of workability. This is illustrated by this chart here. The y-axis is slump flow. And the x-axis is viscosity, slump flow and viscosity, the two attributes of rheology. The green dot in the middle, that's the target for our established SEC mix. Now, every mix has a target flow and viscosity, and, and both are equally important for consistent quality SEC. Now, what is the target? Well, it's different for everybody's mix and everyone's materials and everyone's um, product line they're casting with or the methods of casting. So. I'm gonna give some numbers here, but it's just for the sake of picking a number. Your target's gonna be different than everyone else. So here along the y-axis, we have a low and a high flow, just so you see how they fit on this chart. High flow and low flow, that's a 20 inch on the bottom and a 28 on the top. And then along the x-axis, we have a low viscosity to the left. That's a fast T20 time and a high viscosity to the right, that's a slow T20 time. That's 2.3 seconds versus 6.7 seconds. You can even see the impact on the stability of the mix based on that T20 time. The one that had a very fast flow, you can see segregation in the center of that flow pattern, right? The one that had a very slow flow, where it's a very stable mix. So you can see how viscosity impacts the stability of our product. Now the VSI or visual stability index, um, it has to be addressed and you know, we can't ignore that in here. That's part of the ASTM standard for flow. And it gives us a clue to a problem, right? But it may not give us a clue to the problems either. The VSI is a daily QC assessment. Every time you do a slump flow, you need to do the VSI. And uh, you assess it in a scale of zero to three. And you need to pick when you reject your concrete. Most people reject a three on the VSI. Um, maybe if it hits a two, someone should contact quality control or someone dealing with the mix design to determine if it's gonna be a worse problem or not. Um, that's what most people have set up. You determine that for yourself. So let's take a look at an example. I'm gonna throw some numbers here just as an example. Right, the target test results here are arbitrary conclusions. Um, but let's say for this uh, mix here that we've been working with for some time that we need a 25 inch flow and a, a 3.4 second T20. That's what we're, re we're requiring in Paul's precast here for this mix. Now, let's say one day you notice that you're getting a little higher slump and a lot less viscosity. What is that little higher and a lot less? Well, it falls on this chart, but let's say it's a 27 and uh, you know, a 1.8 seconds, but it's a little higher flow, a little less slow. Now, what do we see when we look at the mix, the finished product in the yard? Well, this unusual pattern here, what is that? Some people call it tiger stripe. This is bleed water trying to escape the mix. Now, perhaps you noticed the issue with the product first, and then you were able to go back and check the QC data. What would cause a lower viscosity and, and this bleeding pattern with a slightly higher flow? Well, most likely it's a case of excess batch water, perhaps through incorrect moisture calculations or just extra water being added to the batch to overcome some increase in water demand. Um, 
we'll get into other causes for this issue in a little, um, as well as some solutions. Let's consider another example. Here we see a reduction of viscosity with no change in slump. So the slump's still good. We have less viscosity. Now, if you're only testing the flow, you would never catch this problem in the laboratory because you're not testing the T20. You wouldn't see that there's a change in viscosity. The product shows us what we call sand trail. This happens when we have a high sand content mix that is bleeding. When the water demand of our mix increases, whether it's from heat or a change in our materials, we react with an increase in high range water reducer until the mix is unstable. Often the bleed water is not noticeable until well after we finished the product and moved on. The increase in high range water reducer maintained the uh, right flow, the 25 inch flow, but it adversely affected the viscosity. Now a better fix would be to make an adjustment to the fine aggregate. And we'll discuss more of that soon. Here we see an increase in viscosity and a slight decrease of flow resulting in extreme bug holes. These types of bug holes are more often a result of excessively high viscosity. Now, what can cause excessively high viscosity? A change in cement, perhaps a variation in alkali or blame fineness. Even temperature of the cement can cause this or an increase in aggregate material retained on the number 30 and number 50 sieves. So spikes on the 30 and 50 sieves in our sand of sense. These two sieve sizes tend to affect the of concrete more than any of the others. How about pore lines? Have you ever seen them? Uh, they're not cold joints, right? That, that results from one layer setting up before casting a second layer. When we get pore lines, the bottom layer has not yet set. So it's not a cold joint. What's happening here? This is a variation of viscosity between two batches. We could be getting the exact same flow on both batches, but the viscosity is different. Notice that on our green dot. Batch one um, had a 25 inch flow, but a, a very high viscosity. Batch two had a low viscosity, and but still had a 25 inch flow. So if we're only testing slump flow, these mixes looked identical, you see, but they're very different in viscosity. So it doesn't matter how much we try to vibrate that line away, we're not gonna um, get two different viscosity fluids to blend together. We can predict four lines in our concrete if we're testing the T20. So without a lot of explanation, this is basically where we're looking at with rheology, that two-dimensional concept. We have shear stress or flow on one side and rate of shear on the other which is viscosity. Now, everything we do to the mix has a, a, some effect on both of these properties, right? Very few things have a, just a single effect on these properties. Most, most things we do to the mix affect both. Sometimes we need to make a change to the mix design to adjust strength or some other property. Then at times we must make an, another adjustment um, for proper rheology. So if we make a change to address strength or air, we may have to make a counter change to get our uh, viscosity or our flow back in line. So let's say we want to increase your flow and your viscosity both. That's the top right corner. How do we get to um, an increased flow and viscosity? Do you see any way to do that on the chart? Well, there's two ways on the chart. You could increase your high range water reducer and then add a VMA. See that high range water reducer increases the flow but lowers the viscosity. The VMA increases the viscosity back to your upper right hand corner. Higher viscosity, higher flow. Um, what is there another way? Yeah, we can use a finer sand. Um, that's not more sand. Notice the increased sand percentage lowers your flow, but using a small amount of fire, finer sand increases flow and increases viscosity. What do you think is cheaper? Using a finer sand or adding extra super and VMA? What's more controlled? Well, it's up to you to calculate how you'd want to get there. Let's focus on bug holes for a minute. What are some of the causes of bug holes? Well, we have a poorly portioned mix, um, a stiff mix, whatever the cause of that may be. Um, improper or lack of vibration, if our mix is intended to be vibrated, right? In most SCCs, they're not, so that wouldn't apply. 
um, I'd say improper vibration maybe does. Um, with SCC mixes, the more we vibrate or introduce dynamic energy to our concrete, the more chances we'll have bug holes. This may be an internal or external vibrator. It may be a tucker belt driving across uh, potholes in your yard. Anything that introduces dynamic energy into your concrete uh, could potentially increase bug holes. We could overly apply our form oil. Excessive form oil on the forms will cr create bug holes. Sands with very few fines um, could have this effect. Excessive bleed water, incorrect viscosity. Let's look at bug holes closer. There's actually, we can categorize bug holes into these three categories. And uh, we'll see the, that they have three different causes. On the far right, we see bug holes caused by oil. So excessive oil in the forms, usually has some dark staining, has very small pinhole sized bug holes um, and clustered together like that. that. Typically that pattern is caused by excessive form oil or perhaps um, the wrong form oil, one that's non-reactive. Now in the center, the, that photo, those bug holes are caused by water. So that's bleed water that moves to the surface of the concrete against the form. And then the water evaporates or gets consumed back in the concrete as it hydrates and leaves these little round pencil eraser sized bug holes. So that's typically bleed water that causes those. And then on the far left, those bug holes are caused by entrapped air. They're irregular shaped bug holes as entrapped air. Now it's important to identify the cause of our bug holes in order to come up with a solution. Because frequently, if the bug holes are caused by water or air, the solution to those two problems is opposite. So if we're having one, do we increase or lower our viscosity? It depends on whether it's a water or an air bug hole. So we know what causes the mix, uh, the problem we know the solution. Right, we can re redesign our mix, increase the fines, fineness, not increase the fine, not increase the sand, but the fineness of the particles. Reduce the bleed water. So for having those small um, rounded bug holes from bleed water, we can reduce that bleed water in the mix. How do we reduce bleed water? We covered it a little earlier. Lower our water some ratio, choose the right, um, re, um, choose a white water reducer and create a well-blended uh, aggregate um, package. So uh, if we have gap graded aggregate or a lot, a lot of aggregate falling on one sieve size and not so much in the middle sizes, this can cause this problem too. The well blended aggregate alleviates bug hole. Apply our form release properly. Um, in, in some cases, maybe a VMA is required to increase the viscosity. If we're getting those air bug holes, our viscosity is too high. So we need to lower the viscosity. How do we do that? Well, don't use a VMA for one thing. Um, maybe we, we're not putting enough water in the mix and we need to use the maximum designed water. You know, if we get our water to ratio excessively low below what the design is, we can get those air bug holes. And then ensure proper vibration. If we're designed to have some vibration, use the right amount. Um, if we're designed not to have any vibration, try to reduce the amount of dynamic energy um, affecting your phone. Oh, I hit the wrong button. Hey, Paul, uh, uh, this is Billy. Uh, one of the other ways of, uh, you get a lot of bug holes is the distance of free fall of the concrete and stuff. That entraps more air, and then that air has to work its way back up through the forms and possibly get stuck on the form boards and stuff. Uh, so if you can limit the free fall, uh, you can minimize how much additional entrapped air you put into the concrete, which are the larger size bubbles. Excellent. Bear with me one second as I uh, sorry, I need to find my place again on the presentation. There we go. All right, Billy, tell me if you can see my screen again. Do I have it right? 
Yeah. Great. Good, Paul. So I'm going to read this information and talk about it. So we talked yesterday about the finest modulus of our sand and our stone. Is there a best finest modulus for SCC? And um, there's a lot of documentation to say, yes, yes, there is. If we average those recommendations together, what we get is a sand FM between 2.5 and 2.7. That's probably the best possible FM for a sand for flowing concrete, self-consolidating concrete. So let me read these two um, lines. They're, they're very uh, impactful. Bug holes can be decreased by providing a sufficient quantity of fine aggregate with high surface area. That's the minus number eight. So larger amounts of sand are not as effective as finer sand. So like we talked about before, a 50-50 sand mix with a coarse sand is not going to give you a good SCC. Using less of a finer sand will. Now here's the big statement. Changing the cement content of a mixture by 94 pounds, about a sack of cement, generally has the same effect on workability as changing the minus number eight fraction of the combined aggregate by 2.5%. So the, selecting the right FM on sand, so we have the right fines in our mix, has the same impact as adding 100 pounds of cement to your SCC mix. What do you think is cheaper? Adding 100 pounds of cement to your mix design or adjusting your fines and your aggregate by 2.5%. Now, the result that's cheaper and more effective is having control of your aggregate, like selecting a finer sand um, somewhere in the range of that 2.5 to 2.7. It's gonna be more impactful and cheaper. Even if we pay more per ton for that sand, it's still gonna be cheaper than 100 pounds of cement. Um, once again, as I started a presentation yesterday, we're trying to troubleshoot a mix or even build a mix from scratch. We always start with aggregate. And if I'm troubleshooting bug holes, first thing I look at is aggregate. We'll go through some of these issues that we may face. Uh, segregation, what, what causes segregation in a mix? Uh, it's excessively wet. We got too much water in, whether it's too moistures or someone adding it. The mix was vibrated too much, or some kind of you know, dynamic energy was introduced that shouldn't have been there. Excessively, excessive drop height, so we're making it fall from too high of a point. Gap graded aggregate will cause segregation and uh, low viscosity in our mix. Well, we, here we see some uh, SEC poured into some box culverts that have segregated, and we see what that looks like in the dried state, right? No rock on the top. How about honeycomb? Honeycomb like this in SCC mixtures is caused from blocking. Um, that's when, uh, as our mix flows through the reinforcement and tight formwork, um, the aggregate gets hung up in the tight spaces and the paste moves on without it. So the paste and aggregate separate because it blocks in a tight uh, formwork situation. So let's illustrate that. Here we're looking down on two pieces of rebar, the green dots. And those little pentagons are the aggregate. And the aggregate tries to flow through that space and it, it just jams up. It won't flow through that space. So how do we get a mix that flows through the rebar uh, better? Do we use a high sand mix and less rock? I'd say no, that's not the solution. Here, look at this. We've used a mix with various sizes, an even graded mix, not gap graded like the top one, even graded. We have the same four big particles, we have a medium particle and some smaller stone particles. So by creating a well-graded aggregate, we can actually use more rock and flow through that re same rebar easier than the gap-graded mix. And of course, we have to have the sufficient amount of paste present as well. So reduce or eliminate vibration is how we uh, prevent segregation. Reduce that drop height, ensure that we have well-graded aggregate um, increase our fines, not the sand content, but the, the fineness of our material can reduce segregation. And we could utilize a VMA if we need to, or fly ash, slag, SCMs will help reduce segregation. It's straight cement mixes are more prone to segregation than ones that incorporate an SCM. So you may have been wondering what I meant by gap graded. So this chart here, this is our combined gradation, sand and stone done on a gradation together. And uh, here we see each of our sizes from uh, three quarter inch rock down to the pan on the sand. 
we see spikes. We see a spike on uh, here, the number four and the number 55th, with uh, the rest of the um, sieve sizes being pretty low. That's gap graded. We need a well graded uh, material to, uh, to make SCC work. Now, when considering our aggregate, it's important to realize not all rocks are the same. Let's look at some of those rocks, the pictures we looked at yesterday, right? Crushed stone versus rounded gravel. And we talked about the importance of each uh, surface texture, um, creating a bond between paste and the aggregate, but also um, particle shape, restricting flow or adding flow. Those same concepts on a stone exist for sand as well. Notice this beach sand. That's a that's look at material. Let's notice this Florida sand when we zoom in real close. But we see seashells and flattened elongated particles in the sand itself. So often sand can create that same restricted flow. Here's a very um, rounded pebble with a textured surface. It's a great sand or SEC. How about this from uh, Sahara Desert sand? So here's examples on the left of a, a number 57 cap graded aggregate blend. So we see the spike on here, the half inch sieve, and on the number 50 sieve with the gap in the middle. So a lot of particles on two different sides, there's not much on the rest. On the right, you see an optimized SCC for the perfect blend of aggregates for flow. Now, what do they have to do to get that perfect blend? Notice they, they mix together a number 67 and a half inch stone and a three eighths heat gravel and the sand. So they have to blend four aggregates to fit within that chart. Now, I don't recommend you go out and blend four aggregates, but um, it's important to understand our, the, the aggregates we are using when they're blended together. How are they going to perform in our SCC mix? What's more important if we can't fit in this recommended uh, chart perfectly? Well, the top size of that chart represented on the left side, um, that's the influences blocking issues more than anything else. So if we have tight reinforcement, I wanna make sure that top size above the number four sieve is within the guidelines, so those blue dotted lines. That's more important to me. Now, if the issue is bug holes and segregation, now the right side of that chart, the, the sieve sizes below the number four, that's more important and affects stuff like suspending large rises segregation or bleed or bug holes is affected more to the bottom side of that chart. So if I can't get the whole chart in line, I'm going to pick what's more important to me, top size, the bottom size, and target that. I'll show you an Excel spreadsheet that you'll get how to um, um, thresh out these combined gradation of your aggregates here at the end of this section. I'll show you that. Spreadsheet. So what causes the low slump flow? Our aggregates can lock together. Maybe we have flattened elongated particles increased in our sand or our stone. If we have segregation and, uh, un and bleeding in our mix, an unstable mix, that can cause low slump flow. Now, what can that look like? One time I had a, uh, I was working with a ready mix producer who was providing SCC to a precast plant for a short period of time. And they couldn't get over a 23 inch flow, no matter how much water and super plasticizer they threw at it. And you never got above a 23. And I went down there and I cut the water spray ratio and I took half the super out that they were dosing it. And then they got a 26 inch flow. So how would less water and less super increase the flow? Well, they were putting so much water and super plasticizer to the mix that the mix was segregating and bleeding right down this flow board. And it just would, the pace would not move the rock. So when I got the right amount of water and chemical in the mix, then they got the slump flow they wanted because uh, then the paste was sufficiently viscous enough to move the stone to that outer limb. Remember polycarboxylate based water reducers are temperature sensitive, all of them are, no matter who you're buying it from. So uh, your performance of your poly may be different in the summer than it is in the winter. Um, maybe our super doses just isn't high enough. And remember those particle sizes, the cubicle versus flat and elongated. Flat and elongated particles are going to lower our slump flow. So what is our solutions? Uh, select the rounded or cubicle well-graded aggregate. Fix the segregation problem. Select the most stable high-range water reducer and use the proper dose. What about slump loss? This Maybe we, are, we batch our concrete at a 26-inch flow. 
and it falls out of the batch plant perfectly at 26 inch flow. And then 15, 20 minutes, we've lost that flow. We just can't get it to come back. Um, this is different than setting, than rapid setting. Slump loss is mostly when the chemical wears off or when the batch water is absorbed out of the concrete from dry aggregate. So uh, we can you do a, a few things. If we're losing slump because our chemicals wearing off in your environment, then slump keepers or slump extenders or maybe a high range water reducer that's designed to work in that environment and hold slump longer would be perfect. The other um, option is make sure our aggregate have, have uh, at least been SSD, have some free moisture on them when we're batching. Well, shrinkage cracks. What are these from? Plastic or drying shrinkage cracks. This is volume change in our concrete due to water or moisture leaving the concrete. Um, if this, <clears throat> this is happening in a plastic state, plastic shrinkage cracks. So while our concrete's um, setting in the forms immediately and we start to see shrinkage of form early on, our water's evaporating out of our mix. Now drying shrinkage typically would happen if we stripped our form, took it outside, and it set out two or three days and then started um, showing signs of shrinkage cracks. It's drying shrinkage cracks, it's still moisture um, evaporating from our product. That's what's causing that. What causes evaporation? A number of things cause evaporation. In fact, here's this uh, nomograph. This chart is in every concrete manual you've ever touched, has this chart in it. Pretty easy to find here, it's here as well if you need it. But uh, we can predict shrinkage cracks if we know the air temperature. So we see that on the top left-hand side. We start with the air temperature. The dotted line goes up to about 40, right? Now, or uh, sorry, starts at 65 degrees, and then goes up to a relative humidity of 40. So on the red line, so we go over to the concrete temperature, down to the wind velocity, and over to rate of evaporation. Below a 0.2 on rate of evaporation, we're probably not going to see shrinkage. 0.2 to 0.3, probably say above that 0.3 mark, we're getting shrinkage cracks for sure. So here in this example, everything is pretty copacetic and we're not gonna get the shrinkage cracks. We wouldn't have to change much before we did. Um, let's say you wanna accelerate this curing and our, our concrete temperature is 80 degrees. All we have to do is change that to 80 and then drop down to the same wind velocity. And now we're above that 0.2 or create a higher wind velocity, and now we're definitely getting shrinkage cracks. Um, where would we see wind velocity? Well, we're pouring outside, we're gonna be affected by the wind. You're pouring outside in Florida in the summer, you're gonna be affected by low humidity and wind, lower than here in Georgia anyway, um, both of which are gonna impact the shrinkage cracking. If you're pouring inside, can you still get that wind velocity? Yeah, um, I worked at a facility that had four large bay doors in a huge uh, plant that had uh, four runs of double T's. And every time someone walked in or out or drove a vehicle in and out of those bay doors, they left them open and created a wind tunnel. The wind velocity inside the shop was actually greater than that outside the shop because of that, that scenario. We can control these things. We can control our air temperature. Well, sure, if we tarp our pieces, we have some control over the air. Relative humidity. Yeah, we cure our pieces by tarping them and covering them. We keep the humidity against the form and uh, we keep that dry wind from blowing across the surface. We can control the wind velocity too by curing our pieces and keeping them covered or keeping the doors to our shop closed. And the concrete temperature we can control with chilled water or hot water to some extent. What about if we're getting low strip strength, what causes there? Well, remember our water summer ratio is the biggest impactor to um, concrete strength, both early and late concrete strength. So make sure our water content is exactly spot on where we want it. We don't have free water getting in somehow between. Sometimes poor quality test testing can cause this lower strength too. Change in our cement properties, change in our aggregate properties. How about temperature during initial set? All those can affect that. But let's go back to the poor quality test testing. This little cylinder here, someone uh, dropped a piece of two by four in the mold and then decided to make the concrete cylinder on top of that two by four. I don't blame that guy so much as I blame the quality control person that wrote the designation for the cylinder across the two by four and then uh, put it in the water bath to be broken later. This started my cylinder wall of shame, by the way. 
So we want to make sure our cylinders are uh, in good condition, our specimens are in good condition um, when we're assessing our strength. Also, one final point on SEC, is that a form pressure? So if we're working with wooden forms, most steel forms are designed for hydrostatic pressure. If we filled them with fluid, it would still um, be able to hold that weight. But if we're using wooden forms or forms not designed for hydrostatic pressure, we wanna make sure we have extra bracing and that we've sealed all our gaps. And this is true on steel forms too. We make sure our gaps are sealed. So that paste flows out between the, any gaps in the forms is gonna leave a honeycomb or bug hole behind. So we've covered this slide before in material section, what makes the SCC possible besides proper blending of aggregate and paste um, content, the polycarboxylate based high range water. In the early days, there was two methods for SCC. We can go back 20 some years and people were doing a powder method is high, typically high cement contents, or an admixture method where they take the exact same mix they would on normal concrete and just throw a bunch of super and VMA to it. But really the answer to a good SCC mixture is blended somewhere in there. Having sufficient fines in the mix, well-graded aggregate, and then also relying on specialty admixtures as well. Here's a little chart you can refer to later when you get the PDF copy of this presentation. I find this a helpful chart when trying to troubleshoot an SCC. Um, across the left side, um, what's the property we're trying to affect? Is it viscosity? Is it too high or too low? Well, then we can go through and say, how do we affect that? If uh, you know, our, our viscosity is too low, the water content's down, right? It's too high, the water content's too high. So uh, we can see how each of these attributes are affected by uh, these, these uh, points of interest here. So it's a self-consolidating. I told you I'd show you that spreadsheet on combined gradation. Let me do that now. I am going to set this up first this time. I need to stop sharing and reshare my Excel spreadsheet. All right, here we go. So in this Excel, Excel spreadsheet, you'll get a um, you get a copy of this um, to use uh, yourself. Now, if you get a copy of this and it doesn't work, it's because you have an older or newer version of Excel. Um, I'm not an IT guy. Your company probably has an IT guy. So when you get a copy of this, and if it doesn't work for you, go to your company's IT guy and click on address the issue with the version of Excel. Now here I have a mix that's pretty gap graded. The blue line, right, is falling outside that recommended red line uh, structure. Um, so it's, it's gap graded there. And uh, I've entered my gradations in these aggregate columns of space for five. And then, um, what we'll do is it'll combine the gradations to create a combined gradation on this chart. And then all we have to do is change the volumes of each we're using. So here I have a number 67, a sand, and a number eight stone. Um, I'm falling outside this, it's probably not gonna flow very good. Um, if I poured this concrete and it didn't flow well, knee jerk reaction may be go 50-50 sandstone. But um, that wouldn't work very well. Let's look at this. What does that do to my max, 50% sand? 50% stone. Wow, it's even worse. Right? It's still gap graded and, and it's out of the chart even further. So a high sand mix is not going to fix this, fix this problem. Let me see what we can do with this. Let's go with 32%. Um, How about this? Let's go 30% sand. And we'll throw a number eight in there. Wow. So by int introducing the number 89 stone, so we're blending two coarse aggregates and fine. We're really close to being in chart, right? Let's say we don't want to use the number eight, 89. We're just going to go to this 67. All right. So here with this particular 67, 70% stone, 30% sand, we're kind of in that in the range now. It's better fitting that gap. 
but uh, let's maybe make another change. Let's go 68, 32. All right, I'm falling a little better in there. Maybe we can try 35, 65. I'd say we're getting in there. Now, neither of these um, are coming out perfect. None of this is coming out perfect in the chart, but we see that by making this change, we've uh, at least slaved it a little better to our recommended range. Now, where does that recommended range come from, this gaps between the red lines? This particular one was designed by the PCI Quality Enhancement Committee, is what our committee recommends. There's a lot of them out there. Probably your admixture company has one they recommend. Um, various organizations throughout Asia and Europe that have been around a long time and dealt with SCC have versions they recommend. Um, some aggregate companies in the U.S. have software that recommends certain ranges. You can use the range you want to use. If you don't have one, you can feel free to use the one provided here in the spreadsheet. But the best option for this mix would be probably to use this smaller stone. Oh, it's pretty, it's, it, yeah, in this example I have in here, that these are, these are tough to get in that, in that line. Probably the blend of the two would be better. Yeah, that's perfect. So if you have a, if you have the option for multiple aggregate, it works. Now that's just the gradations I've entered in. That's the last place I was at and used this sheet at. But your donations might be different. I encourage you to take the sheet, enter your aggregate, available aggregate in here, and find out what your proportion is. Any of the fixes that just walked through the scenarios, the answer to getting better flow was to lower my fan content. Notice what I did here. I'm not saying that's right for you, but in the example I've given here, every one of the solutions required a lower sand content than what I initially had. So we're nowhere near those 50 50 sandstone mix. And let me go back to my presentation. So that wraps up um, self-consolidating concrete. I'll ask Billy, Billy, if you're if you're on there still, um, where does Florida DOT stand with SCC? It's approved, correct? Yeah, it's approved by the DOT, and um, uh, it worked well, you know, with the industry. Uh, We've eliminated the top end. It's all based on stability, not on uh, what the actual slump flow is. And then uh, the lower end is uh, uh, 20 inches now, uh, you know, because you get a lot of energy by the placement method that you're using. So if it's coming out of a truck versus out of a tucker belt, you get a lot more energy coming out of a truck. So you really don't need as high of a spread to get the flow that you need and stuff. So. Uh, they, they've worked well with, uh, you know, making it easier for the, uh, the people to get it placed, especially in U-beams and things like that, where you actually need a very high spread to, to get under the uh, concrete and uh, uh, under the form. The, uh, you know, one of the things, too, when you were talking about uh, low slump flow, when you get that, you know, Florida doesn't have a big problem. <clears throat> with clays, uh, but they do happen. Um, and the one clay that you have to be worried about in Florida is called a Montmorillonite. It's a preci precipitate uh, clay, but it's very, very fine. And when it goes, when they, when they dredging the sand, it becomes uh, attached to the, uh, the sand aggregate. And what, it, what the problem with that clay is, is that it's very absorptive and the super, the polycarboxylate can't tell the difference between the clay particle and a cement particle. So they're not as efficient. So the more Montmorillonite you have in your sand, the lower your slump, uh, you know, I've seen it come out and it looks like block mix uh, coming out and uh, you wonder what the problem is. If you're getting low slump flow, one of the things you should check in your troubleshooting is check to see if you have that clay and the best way to do that is with a test called the methylene blue value test and it'll tell you if you have an absorptive clay in your in your sand aggregate it's a very uh, simple test to run so yeah that's an excellent point you know, here in in Georgia a lot of clays in the soil another impact we have is in the coarse aggregate 
we typically get mica dust and mica dust will do the same thing in the, in the mix as well. Um, that's a good point. I, I appreciate you filling me in on the Florida advancements in SCC. Here in Georgia, we're, we're really just getting to the point where the DOT is um, considering SEC in pre-stress. So uh, we'll probably be doing some of the first self-consolidating in, in pre-stress for Georgia DOT very soon up here. So it's interesting, some of the states, I think Florida was an early adopter. Oh, so you mentioned 20 inch flow too. That reminded me, I should have made this point earlier when we were talking about the slump flow test. So uh, a while back, people would say, well, there's a lot of work to qualify my SCC mix. It's kind of low flow, it's 20, 21 inch flow. Um, I'm not gonna call it an SCC. I'm gonna call it high flow concrete and just do my normal concrete requirements and uh, not have to go through that qualification process for PCI. Well, the, the um, shortcut there, the roundabout, the loophole has been closed. So ACI has defined SCC as from a 20 inch flow or greater. And um, PCI says, follow those guidelines. If you can test your mix, and it achieves a 20 inch flow, then the mix must be tested as if it were an SCC. So even if you're saying it's not SCC, because I have to vibrate it or whatever reason, if you can get achieve a 20 inch flow, you have to qualify it like it's an SCC mix. There's no way around that. So uh, I know the Ross Bryan inspectors are kind of cracking down on that in the last year or two, um, companies who were doing low flow SCC and just calling it conventional. Yeah, Paul, I believe that uh, the Florida DOT on the low end of the spec, uh, your target is going to be 22 and a half inches, but you have plus or minus, you know, two and a half inches. So your minimal, minimal accepted slump flow is going to be 20 inches, uh, you know, to, uh, to meet self-consolidating. So I, I believe that's how the new, they're actually in the process right now of drafting the new specification and stuff. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, let's carry on with the next section, architectural concrete. So we're gonna discuss some features of architectural concrete that impact concrete mix design. Let's see, there it is. So we'll start with particularly white cement. Now, you don't have to use white cement in architectural concrete, there's plenty of gray cement. But uh, we discussed designing around gray. Let's discuss what's different about white cement. So white cement is uh, made from materials containing um, negligible amounts of iron, that aluminum ferrite uh, we talked about as being one of the four components of concrete or cement. So uh, we're gonna use as little as possible, as little as possible manganese oxides as well. These are what make gray cement gray. So by removing those uh, components, we can create white cement. So all white cements are, are different in color. So there's several brands of white cement um, it, nationally and then in several international brands of white cement that are available in, in the United States. You cannot just switch from one white cement to another without it changing the color of your concrete. No cement, no two cements look alike. Uh, specifically gray, but also in white too. White cements conform to ASTM C150. And then uh, they're produced often as a type one or a type three. So some companies have a type three white. Type one white typically has a lower or a higher blame, a higher fineness than type one gray. And this is to overcome some of the um, characteristics of white. So a type three white sets extremely fast. Now slag can be used as a filler with white cement to lessen the cost of the mix, right? White cement's expensive compared to gray cement. So we can use slag to lessen that cost. We can also use slag with gray cement to create an off-white color if we have a high enough slag percentage. But you need to understand that slag will discolor your concrete as it bleaches out. So it usually takes about seven days for that blue-green color I mentioned to people on the concrete. Slag is not a true white, it's gonna create an off-white. It varies in color to a great deal. White cement's designed to be consistent in color, slag is not. So if we're gonna use it, we need to use it in limited doses and on light colors. 
Um, I once did a project in Philadelphia for the Amtrak headquarters, a five-story tall, pre-stressed, clad building. And uh, the color of the building is, it looked like Home Depot orange, right? Bright orange. And uh, to cheapen the mix up a little bit, it was a, a white cement and 40% slag, um, which it, it made a mix less expensive for sure. Um, it looked good eventually. When we erected the panels within a few months, within four or five months of casting them, no two panels on that building looked alike. It, it looked like a patchwork quilt of different colored concrete. And of course, the architects and Amtrak came out and said, take it all down. It's terrible. Um, we convinced them to wait. You know, Let's wait a couple months. We'll meet back out here with a plan of how to move forward. Two months later, we go out and look. Every panel looks perfectly alike. Every panel on that building. It took that extra two months before the uh, slag reached its final color. And then we never produced another mix with slag in it for architectural concrete because no, no QC guy could sleep for you know, three months in that project. You have to have nerves of steel to use slag and cement at home. So what is cement made out of? White cement's just like gray. We have our limestone, we have our sand for the silica, some clay, gypsum control set time. All that's cooked together and creates clinker, which is ground in a ball mill to create our cement. But each of these materials are carefully selected for their color. Gray cement is not, white cement is. So the whiteness of that cement is controlled. So that means the consistency of color is not monitored or controlled for gray cement. So if we're using gray cement in architectural mixes, there can be variation from load to load of our cement in color. I've done a number of projects in my life that the gray color of the concrete needed to be extremely consistent. So the mix is on consisted of white cement pigmented back to concrete gray. So that it'd be consistent. Color. So when we use our, our white cement mixes, um, one thing to be aware of is that de having dedicated equipment, batching and delivery equipment. And this doesn't mean we have one mixer for white and one mixer for gray in color, no. It doesn't mean we have a tucker that uh, delivers gray and a tucker that delivers white, no. But while we're delivering white cement mixes, that equipment should only be doing that mix. We can't switch back and forth between a white mix and a red mix. What will happen? You'll get a lot of pink mixes. We can't switch from a white mix that has white stone or light colored sand and stone, and then go and batch some gray concrete that has a dark gray aggregate in it. Because if you don't clean your equipment out perfectly, the two black stones in that four yards of concrete will find their uh, way to the face of that panel and it'll be very visible. So contamination is, is a consideration when working with white concrete. If we're using white cement mixes, we probably should specify light colored aggregate, right? We wanna match our aggregate, our sand specifically, to the color of our paste. So if we have a white cement, white concrete, we should be using white sand or close to it. If we have a light buff or yellow concrete with white cement, we should get a sand that matches that color better. It gives us um, a more even look to our concrete. Say a few words about pigments. There's two attributes of pigment we need to be aware of. One is tinting strength and the other is saturation point. So tinting strength is how much color can we get out of a given dosage rate of pigment. Look to the, the picture to the right. Here we have two different pigments. Both of them are a yellow buff color. So let's say they're the exact same color from two different manufacturers. The uh, samples are um, layered, you see the three layers. The top layer is 5% pigment, the middle is 3% pigment, the bottom is 1% pigment on both of these, uh, these color samples. And uh, you notice they have different tinting strengths. So at 1%, 3%, and 5%, if we compare them, they give very different color for the, the dosage we pick. In fact, I'd say the 3% of the bottom one matches the color of the 1% to the top one pretty close. So they're the same color, just they give a different strength of tinting per dose. So we need to be aware of that when comparing um, pigments. You know, if we're looking at cost, we're not looking at cost uh, per pound, we're looking at cost per treated yard for the color we want. 
The other uh, attribute is saturation point. So there's a point in which we can get no more color out of that pigment, no matter how much we add. So we might go to five or 6% of a red pigment, and then we can go to seven, eight, nine, 10%, and still don't get any color, more color than at the five or 6%. That's because we reached a saturation point. The pigments are generally um, either a synthetic iron oxide or a natural iron oxide. The synthetics have a higher tinting strength than natural iron oxides. Um, synthetics will give you a more intense color, whereas naturals will give you more earth tone muted color. Synthetics are relatively expensive, whereas natural iron oxides less expensive. Now, because of that tending strength, the synthetics, we can have a lower addition rate. Maybe our bottom end addition rate might be somewhere between a quarter and three quarter percent. Whereas with natural iron oxides, our bottom end addition rate might be somewhere between one and three percent. So this argument happens at, our, at the architectural committee at PCI from time to time over the years of what should be the required low end dosage of pigment. And it really depends on are you using a synthetic or natural. So half the size is what the lower it should be 1%. Well, if you're using natural, that's true. And the other half of the group will say, you know, we use as little as half a percent. Well, if it's a synthetic iron oxide, that's acceptable. And then there's blends of the two. Now, even at a given company, there may be, especially in liquid pigments, there may be blends of synthetics and naturals together to make the same color. I once produced um, a kind of an orange buff color that was a blend of a synthetic red and a natural yellow. And then I poured it in a high flow mix. It wasn't really SCC, but a high flow mix by a nine inch slump. And then when we vibrated, those synthetics and natural separated. So they don't blend super well, especially in high flow concrete. And then instead of a um, uh, orange buff color, I got a red and yellow tie-dyed panel where you can see where those uh, the vibrator moved across the face of the panel. So uh, we want to make sure if we're using blended colors, pre-blended colors, that uh, if they're synthetic and natural, we keep our slump flow under control. We don't have a uh, segregation of bleeding in our mix. So often there's uh, systems that will allow you to to blend your own colors in your own facility. But uh, even if you're having it pre-blended, pretty much any colors made from these five colors, synthetic red, natural red, synthetic yellow, a natural yellow ochre, uh, and then a synthetic black iron oxide. Notice we call it black, but with iron oxides, it's never truly black, right? It's a charcoal gray at most. And the samples provided there are the five, three, and 1% color. You can see the difference between the tinting strength in synthetics versus natural. This is in iron oxides. There's also others. There's um, titanium dioxide, which is a white pigment. So we can create a very white concrete if we use white cement with titanium dioxide. We can create a pretty white concrete if we use gray cement with titanium dioxide. These are the expensive pigments. There's green pigment, which comes from chromium oxide and blue pigment, from cobalt oxide, extremely expensive blue pigment. I used to get requests for this in samples back when I worked in architectural pre-stress. And uh, lots of architects and owners would want to see the blue sample. And we'd tell them, no, uh, we don't think you can afford the blue concrete or we're going to want to pay for it. And they'd say, I get offended. Ah, we want the blue sample. Well, I'd bring the blue sample and then I'd have a little brown sample off to the side. And I'd show them the blue. they say, exactly what we want. And I'd show them the cost of the blue. And then they would say, well, the brown's nice too. Yep, so um, very expensive pigment to work with. If you ever get to do blue jobs, count yourself as lucky. I've done a handful of them in my life. It, here's the other point I wanted to mention though, is that of carbon black, a type of black pigment that is very black. You can make jet black concrete out of carbon black, but it's not recommended to use. You should not use this in your plant. Um, carbon black is not color stable and it, it leaches out of the concrete in a very short period of time. So, specifically know of a project here in Atlanta. Carbon black was used and the, the concrete was jet black on day one. And then six months later, it was a medium gray. And two years later, it's a light gray concrete. So that, that's not color stable. We should avoid using carbon black.
what form does our pigment come in? We have three forms, powder. That's probably used most frequently by architectural precasters is powdered uh, pigment. Um, you know, that has to be hand weighed up. Maybe it's hand weighed and pre-bagged for you or you're opening larger bags and scooping it out and pre-weighing it. It's a little harder to handle. Uh, there's liquid versions. That's just the powder turned into a liquid. Um, a lot of concrete block plants will use this powder. Um, some structural and architectural plants will use a liquid. Um, this can be dosed through equipment. So the equipment's very difficult to work with and it clogs up because this stuff settles out very quickly. Uh, it also has shelf life, relatively short shelf life to liquid that goes bad fairly quickly versus powder is, is stable on the shelf for a very long period of time. And then there's a granular, which is the best of both worlds, right? Um, you can use it in any color application. There's equipment that can dose granular as easy as it can liquid and the granular dosing systems don't clog up. Um, you can get both synthetic uh, and natural iron oxides for powder and liquid, though the granules are typically only synthetic iron oxides. Um, it's very important to be careful with these liquids and the granules both. They, they're expansive when they hit water, so it looks like a smaller dosage. Um, I had a uh, operated a batch plant where uh, in Pennsylvania, where um, in Amish country, and our whole batch plant property was was paved in concrete and all led into a single drain. Well, one of the uh, workers was carrying a 30 gallon uh, cardboard barrel of red pigment and uh, bouncing across the yard with it, it fell off the forks and busted. And instead of putting sand around it, he decided he'd hide his mistake by washing it down the drain. So he got a hose out and he washed all the pigment down the drain perfectly. You couldn't see a drop of red on the yard. So he thought he got away with it until an hour later, we started getting phone calls from the, all the Amish farmers next door to the plant. And we go over the edge of the back plant, look over, and there's a bunch of red cows out in the field. They've all been waded through this pond that was filled with red pigment. And I bet you a dozen ponds downstream would all turn red too. Um, this is very expensive. We want to keep it tight control on these pigments if they're in our yard. So how do we specify pigments for use in an architectural precast? So uh, I'll, I'll mention two things here. We can look at color samples through the PCI color and texture guide, second edition. That's available free online. Um, you can buy them through the PCI bookstore. I'd recommend if you're doing architectural concrete, having the PCI color and texture guide. It's a three ring binder full of plates of different colors and textures of concrete, different aggregates, different pigments. And uh, we can have our customers pick through there. If we don't wanna make 150, 250 samples, we can have them pick through there and, and determine the color and texture they like. And then on the back of the plate, it tells us generally what we need to use to make that color. Um, then as far as pigment additions, I would say that a good range to fall between is one and 5%. Less than 1% pigment is very difficult to control consistent color. More than 5% pigment, starts to impact our compressive strength. So this isn't a um, hard and fast rule. There's plenty of reasons people use up to 10% pigment and just accept the strength loss. Maybe they're over-designed with strength anyway. And there's plenty of people that can control their color consistently under 1%. So maybe you wanna operate outside that range. But if you are operating outside of the one to 5% pigment dosage, you should be aware of the dangers of that. Inconsistent color below 1% and strength reduction. We should never ev evaluate the color of the pigment outside of the concrete and think, if this pigment looks like this, then the concrete's gonna look the same. No, because all your other constituents impact the color of concrete. The fines on the sand will impact the color of concrete. Um, fines on the stone, your cement itself, variation in the cement, water cement ratio, temperature, everything that you do to your mix can impact the color of the concrete itself. So we don't open a, a bucket of pigment and say that's what my concrete's gonna look like. We make concrete samples. So when we make our concrete test batches and our samples, when we wanna record, of course, our mix design for our test batch, the way we would with any mix design, but we also wanna record the color number, the lot number of our pigment sample on that mix design. Notice it's not just the name, 
It's not just uh, you know, precast red that we write on the mix design, but it might be the supplier name, the color name, and then a designation number, and then a lot number two. So if we end up producing that project a year and a half later, we can refer back to the lot we got that pigment out of to see if anything has changed in the year and a half since you've made the sample. Now, when we make these 12 inch by 12 inch samples that customers choose from when we're choosing colors, we wanna replace those samples every two years. After two years, they've aged to a point where your new concrete structure is not gonna match that older concrete. So if you have a salesman driving around with a five-year-old color sample in the back of his trunk, trying to sell that, you need to get those replaced. Pull in all your old color, 12 inch square color samples, and replace them with new samples that you've made. Every two years, they should be changed out. So when you make those samples for your sales team, they should set and cure at least one week before you hand them out. So your salesman that tells you, hey, make the sample for me tonight, I gotta show it to a, sale, to a potential customer tomorrow. That's a bad idea. It's a really bad idea. They should give you at least a week's heads up in order to, uh, manufacture these samples and allow them to cure out before they get shown. Because in this early, the first week, the first seven days, the color changes a great deal. So if we look at that color sample at day one versus day three versus day seven, they're gonna look like different mixed designs. Allow them to cure one week. This is particularly true with gray cement. It takes gray cement longer to cure out to its final color than it does white. And it's particularly true with any pigment containing the yellow iron oxide. So that's buffs, oranges, browns, anything that contains a yellow iron oxide is going to take longer to, to cure out to its final color than the other colors. So I know that's hard to do. I know it'd be very difficult for you to go back to your sales team and say, hey, I need a week. <laughs> You're going to get pushback for it. But if at all possible, um, go back to your organizations and drive home the importance of, way, of allowing a week for these samples to cure before starting to show them. Let's focus a little bit on aggregate. So I know I spent a lot of time yesterday and today talking about how to avoid gap graded aggregate and you have to use well graded aggregate for everything from durability to strength to flow. In architectural concrete exposed aggregate, we need to use gap graded, right? It's the best for exposed aggregate finish. Why is that? Well, it gives a more uniform look. If all the stones on the face of that mix when we expose a rock, if they're all the same size, it's gonna be much more uniform look to our mix. So here we're choosing gap graded aggregate for the aesthetic, even though we're sacrificing flow characteristics, strength characteristics, durability characteristics. Not saying we won't have strong and durable concrete, but we, we'll have to overcome those issues in another way. But we're choosing gap graded aggregate for the look itself. Once again, the sand should uh, match the color of the paste. The color of the sand should be as close as possible. This will help it look more even and consistent. It masks anything like uh, mesh lines or material segregation, vibration lines for vibrating our, our architectural concrete. So if we match that paste, the cement and the water paste and pigment to the color of the sand, it'll hide a lot of scents. Our aggregates need to be washed. There's a lot of un unwashed aggregate on the markets. Um, any powder coming in on our stone will affect the color of our concrete. If it's washed in the summer, but not in the winter, that's gonna change the color of our concrete. So we need to make sure our aggregates are always washed. Any excessive quantities of the minus 200 sieve on our, on our gradations will affect the color of the concrete. So if we're using a brown sand and we get a spike in the number 200 and pan on our sieve analysis, you can expect our concrete to look more brown than it was before. <clears throat> How about water cement ratio and color? We talked about water cement ratio being the biggest impactor to strength and the biggest impactor for durability. It's a pretty good size impactor to um, color of our concrete as well. Look at this little chart, this picture on the right. That's a snapshot out of a as some concrete manual, black and white photo taken with a cell phone camera. So it's poor quality photo for sure. But even in a poor quality photo, we can see the difference between water cement ratios. Now the four circles on the top are the concrete in this dry condition. 
And the four circles in the bottom are the same concrete, but the concrete's been made in a different way. Look at the difference between, you know, this is a pretty wide stretch uh, swing from a 0.3 to a 0.6 water spring. But let's just concentrate on the difference between a 0.4 and a 0.5, or even a 0.3 and a 0.4. You know, you might be targeting a 0.38, and then may, you may vary from a 0.35 to a 0.40 and be acceptable. But think about the color variation you're going to see with the variation of water swing ratio. What creates that water swing ratio variation? Inaccurate moistures can be one. So not having accurate moisture reading with either our moisture probes or if quality control department is measuring it manually, having inaccurate moisture readings could be changing the color of your concrete. How about uh, not um, calibrating our moisture uh, meters in a bash plant significantly? Uh, that can impact it too. How about just excess water in our process somehow? That can impact the color too. You need to have control over our water in order to control the color. So let's talk a little bit about architectural mix design. So our, our cement contents are gonna vary depending on our compressive strength. Usually our strip strengths are gonna mostly be the cause for our choosing one cement content over another. Typically across the entire country, architectural mixes fall somewhere between 635 and 750 pounds. I think that sounds a little high. Um, here in the Southeast, I don't think we get up that high in, for architectural mixes for probably 600 to 700, so we're a little lower. Um, but this is an average for nationally. Remember uh, pigment volume when we proportion? Remember how we did absolute volume on all of our materials? Remember that for pigment too? If we have 5% pigment on a heavy cement mix, that's a lot of volume. So our yields could be off if we're not calculating the pigment volume. Now, all we had to do is add another line in our um, mixed design sheet for pigment. Like whether, whether Add it near the cements or the aggregates. It's another line. You can get the specific gravity of the pigment from the supplier and uh, make sure we count that in with our uh, volumes when we're calculating the, our yield of our concrete. Our face mixes or you know, architectural mixes in general, face mixes if we're doing panels, need to be as impermeable as possible. This makes them last longer, protects them from corrosion, um, color adds to color vibrancy creates a more durable and strong concrete if we have impermeable concrete. So PCI gives you um, a target here. So the maximum absorption of your mix um, cannot exceed 6% over 24 hours. How's this tested? Well, um, this, the ASTM standard says we have a six inch cube. We can also use a four by eight cylinder. The standard is a six inch cube. Um, we create our concrete. We draw it, make sure it's completely dry. Um, and then uh, once that cube is dry, we measure it, we weigh it. We submerge it into water uh, halfway up for 12, or 12 hours. We submerge it over for 24 hours. And then we uh, get it to SSD. Basically, we mop the water off the surface and weigh it again and make sure the difference is not greater than 6%. So we're measuring the absorption of our concrete the same way you would measure absorption in your aggregate. Um, so we want impermeable concrete for our face mix. The cement to fine aggregate ratio should be somewhere between one to one and one to three if the mix is gonna be exposed aggregate. And that's so the aggregate doesn't dislodge, right? We can't um, just have a lot of powder, a lot of binder cement, and then coarse aggregate, especially if it's gap rated with very, with very little sand. Um, there's going to be nothing to bind that coarse aggregate to the paste, and it's going to dislodge and create these bald spots in our concrete panel. So this kind of that kind of um, heavier stone mixes should be designed with a lower slump, or we, if we're going for a higher slump with a heavy stone mix, maybe we consider a VMA. Maybe it doesn't have to be SCC. If we're just targeting a six-inch slump with a very fine sand, very little bit of sand, so it's um, just mostly. Um, a lot of stone, a VMA could hold that mix together in the production. Consider this statement. The optimum temperature for color consistency is between 65 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Think about that. If there's an optimum temperature variation for color consistency, that means we can get variation in our color just by swings in temperature. 
maybe that doesn't impact Florida as much as it does other areas. I mean, right now here in Georgia, it could be 50 degrees in the morning and 80 degrees in the afternoon this time of year. So we can have these huge swings in temperature. Of course, if you're producing right now in Florida um, and you'll be producing this colored project for the next four months, your, your temperature is going to vary and that temperature variation can create color variation. Is there a lot you can do to, to adjust that? Maybe not. Let's say covering our pieces does a lot to impact concrete temperature. So one thing I'll go back to making sure we cure adequately when we're producing precast concrete, whether we're trying to retain strength, uh, increase durability, or in this case, even have color consistency. Curing our product is very important. Now, I'm, I can't, we don't have time to cover every possible aesthetic of a mix and, and the design considerations. We're gonna cover two, how to adjust mix design for two particular aesthetics, just to give an example of uh, what we may have to do with our mix. So here, if we're gonna have acid etch or light sandblast, so some guidelines for mix design if we're gonna acid etch or light sandblast. Our coarse aggregate to fine aggregate ratios should be around, somewhere around 60% coarse to 40% fine. Now that's a lot of that's a lot of fines compared to uh, what we may put in there. So why the extra fine aggregate? Why the extra sand in an acid edge? Well, it's going to if we have a high stone content, the stone might pop through the face when we acid edge or sandblast in irregular patterns. So the heavier sand gives us more of a sugar cube look and doesn't allow the coarse aggregate to pop through and uh, give an irregular. Um, broken pattern. So if we're, if we're doing very fine form work with a lot of reveals or tight spaces, maybe a 3 8 inch aggregate is best fit for us. Once again, match the sand as close as possible to the, um, the paste color. This is going to hide those blemishes in production. Our batch to batch water cement ratio fluctuations should be minimized for color consistency. Right? Tight water smart ratio means tight color consistency. We need to confirm that our aggregate is resistant to acid before developing the mix. So uh, we're gonna um, not, we're, our, all of the concrete is gonna be affected by acid or carbon dioxide in the environment, many other things in the environment. We wanna make sure our mix can resist that. So once again, low absorption, below 6% absorption on this. Sands with close to 60% passing the 30 sieve may have an increased water demand, which means they require a higher cement content. So um, get that uh, number 30 sieve on our sands um, below that 60% level, and it, we can reduce our cement content on the mix, right? And have uh, less water demand to be a good thing. Now let's go the opposite end of the spectrum for finishes and talk about exposed aggregate. So some guidelines of mix design. The coarse fine aggregate ratio should be closer to 65 to 35. So there's a less sand in, a, in exposed aggregate than there is in, uh, in acid wash or uh, sandblast. If we're using the roll on a form retarder, so we put on a form retarder on our forms with cast concrete on it, and the next day or next two days, some amount of time, we pull that out of the form and we sand, or water blast it off exposing the aggregate. Now, when we're blasting off the retarder face and exposing the aggregate, we need to do that consistently between panel and panel. Now, I don't mean consistent amounts of time. I really mean it's consistent maturity. Um, so we wanna roughly blast these at the same compressive strength. So if we're stripping some panels at 10 hours and some panels at 18 hours, there are gonna be different compressive strengths, different maturities, when we wash the retarder off the surface to expose the aggregate. So the depth of etch is gonna be different based on that. In fact, if you ever cast one of these panels on a Friday and come in Monday and try to acid etch it, boy, it looks really different. So we wanna make sure we're timing our casting and washing operations so that they're consistent every time. Once again, for these exposed aggregate, we wanna choose a gap graded coarse aggregate for the look. You know, we want to use a rounded or cubical shape. That's very important here. These flat and elongated pieces stack up on top of each other and create a spotty, uneven looking surface. So cubical 
or rounded aggregate for exposed aggregate only. <clears throat> Sometimes mason sands um, are used in exposed aggregate. Um, it's a very fine sand and that'll help uh, give us a more consistent exposed aggregate look. It's not always true, but it can be done. So when we're making our small batches for samples, we want to ensure that the colors mix thoroughly through. Now, if we have a large twin shaft mixer we're making colored concrete in, it may only take two minutes for that color to blend into that mix, maybe. I mean, whatever it is, it's not going to take long. It's a very aggressive mixer. Now, if we have a small mixer down in a laboratory and we're making one cubic foot, it's going to take a lot longer for that pigment to blend in. So we want to make sure that we're allowing the color to thoroughly mature while mixing with smaller batches in the sample laboratory. <clears throat> We want to make sure our sample generation process matches the batch plan as close as possible. We're trying to eliminate the variability. So when we're sequencing what goes into the mixer first, sand or stone, when the cement goes in, when the water's added, we want to mimic what's happening in our real batch plan as close as possible. Also, with a very aggressive mixer, we don't want to be hand mixing sample concrete. That's, you're never going to get aggressive enough to mimic the color. In fact, I would say, It'd be a great thing to try if you wanted to drive this home at your facility is take the exact mix in a, in a larger mixer versus hand mix in a wheelbarrow and it would look like two different concretes. So we always wanna generate these samples when uh, producing architectural concrete. These are our mock-ups. We invite the customer or the architect or engineer out and uh, review these mock-ups. This is for approval. So we got to the point where we're past the samples. They're gonna approve these mock-ups for production. The purpose of the mock-ups is to give the widest range of variation that is acceptable in your production. So you're not producing one perfect mock-up and say everything looks like that. You're giving the least, um, I don't know how to word that. We're, we're doing the most possible variation that's still acceptable in your mix. So when doing these mock-ups, make sure we vary everything. If for these are form finish and acid etch, like you see here, some of the um, sections of the acid etch are deeper than others. So we have lighted acid versus heavier. And the idea is it's all acceptable, but it still pushed the limits of what is acceptable. Now we get the architect to sign off on each of these forms. We get them to sign off the form finish, and the acid etch. You see here in that um, second from the left, some uh, dark writing on there that's pointing out a um, Purpose, uh, purposeful repair. So once this mock-up uh, panel was produced, somebody went out and took a hammer and purposely busted a corner off that section. And then we repaired that section. And uh, we had the architect sign off on that repair. Um, this is a great feature and not a lot of people are doing, but you probably should do repairs to your pieces and get them to sign off on an acceptable looking repair. There's a lot going on with this architectural piece. Look, there's four different mixes. There's a dark gray, there's a backer, regular structural mix. There's a, a light uh, buff, off-white mix. There's a pink mix, there's form finish, there's acid wash, there's sandblast, there's a whole lot going on there. Every attribute of this should be um, signed off on by an engineer, including the back finish. It's a great thing, or the architect. Great thing to get the back finish signed off on. It's float, steel trowel finish, um, produce purposely produce variation in that finish and then get that variation signed off of it. Um, if you're doing thin brick panels, um, how about breaking, purposely breaking a certain number of brick and doing a repair and get the brick repair signed off on as approved. Here's two uh, resources that everyone working in architectural mixes should have. You should have this at your desk. Um, number one is Excellent publication, um, originally produced by Sid Freeman, um, one of the gurus of architectural um, concrete at PCI. And it's a collection of ideas on the production of architectural precast concrete. Um, I barely scratched the surface of what this manual has as far as uh, architectural mixed design. So uh, anyone doing architectural concrete could have this uh, reference in their library and um, make it available for everyone to read. I'd encourage that. On the bottom there, there's the architectural precast color and texture selection guide. That's what it looks like. It's a great resource. You can get that on at PCI's website. 
um, for free. I would get that and look through, see what's possible with mixed design. And I'm gonna quickly go through some troubleshooting. We've been looking at good concrete and talking about good concrete for two days now. I'll show you some ugly concrete. This is the legendary formation. These uh, Jersey barriers, highway barriers, they look ancient, right? They're two years old. The bottom corroded concrete is two years old. The, the corrosion happens three months after they're in place, started happening two years later and they're deteriorated and ready to be replaced. Look what's going on here. This is a European concrete. I like this picture though. It's kind of like a double T type structure. It's going on here and you can see there's exposed rebar. So there wasn't enough rebar clearance that created a problem. Um, water got to the rebar. Where'd the water come from? We'll trace it up. There's a crack in the, in the um, flange of this piece. Water came through the crack. The concrete's cracking. That's not a very good concrete. We need to troubleshoot that. But even if the concrete didn't crack, water still got through the joints. The joints weren't sealed correctly during the installation. So you can do everything right for the durability of concrete uh, in your plant. And if you partner with someone who cuts corners during the installation, it could still cause you problems with your end structure. So first we'll talk about fluctuations in, in the air in the concrete. What causes the fluctuation in the air? Everything, go through the list. Everything we do concrete will, will change the air content. So it, we really should go down this list and kind of troubleshoot that if we're having air flow. Most people start with the powders, fly ash or uh, cement. Might be a good place to start. Um, typically, I start with uh, the sand. Remember, everything I do, I start with aggregate. It's the biggest impactor in our country. How about retardation? We know what makes our concrete set slower. Lower temperatures, excessive mixed water, changes in cement. And if we know what causes those, then we know how to prevent it. Get the temperatures up, keep our water cement ratio down, make sure our cement doesn't have variables like when we uh, monitor our, our mill certs. Acceleration is the exact opposite. It's setting up too fast, well, high temperatures will cause that. Um, too little mixed water, like we've got our water to ratio too low, but we can make adjustments um, to those things to prevent that acceleration. How about loss of strength and strength gain, low cylinder strengths. We talked a little bit about what causes that, um, as well as uh, lack of strength gain. First thing I look at when we talk strength actually is water. Water is probably our biggest impact. If we have low strength or low strength gain, let's look first at our water. Water cement ratio is the biggest impactor when we talk about strength. Also, there's freezing or burnout. You're not going to get freezing in your concrete in Florida, but burnout can be a problem. This is when uh, we have too much, uh, too high a temperature too early. So we accelerate our concrete strength gain so fast that it gives out on us very early. I remember having a mix that uh, achieved 12,000 PSI in 48 hours. And then in 56 days, it, it achieved 12,000 PSI. You got all the strength it was ever gonna get in the first two days and never got any more after that. That's burnout, right? Our, our temperatures got high and, and our hydration happened fast enough that it just quits on us early. They're in a lot of high strength uh, concrete producers will use a retarder even in the cooler weather to prevent those burnout. I'm going to skip this. We talked a little bit about this, uh, your mix design, if it's acceptable. Um, I will talk about coring, uh, when coring our samples um, for strength, particularly if we get a low strength result and we have to go out and core a piece. Remember that the average of three cores only needs to be 85% of the design strength. So we don't have to get 100% of the design, just 85% of the design strength. Well, why, why does ACI say that's true? Well, because the coring process shears the aggregate, it cuts it in half. So it actually affects the compressive strength. So uh, our cores only need to be 85% of design strength with no one core falling below 75% of that strength. Now the DOT might not agree with this criteria, but this is what ACI says is acceptable. You know, we talked about shrinkage cracks, drying shrinkage, what causes them, how to prevent them. Um, Let's talk about thermal cracking. So what is thermal cracking? Thermal cracking is 
um, when we have a variation in the temperatures, the curing temperatures inside of our concrete, mostly produced by variation in mass of concrete. So think of two specific pre-stress product types, that of the double T for parking garages or the stadium riser. So a double T might have more massive stem, less massive flange, right? What if it's a field top T and it might only have a two inch thick flange, but eight inch thick and 30 inch deep um, stem. Well, those, the massive concrete is going to heat up faster than, this, than the, the flange. The stem is going to cool down slower than the flange. These variations in temperature, rise and, um, and lowering, are going to create a, a variation in the rate of thermal expansion. And the rate of thermal expansion varies. It's going to create a crack between those two areas. So this is, I, I point out double T's and stadium risers because it probably happens more frequently in them because there's a greater variation in dimensional sizes throughout the member. So how do we address thermal cracking? Well, we can reduce that variation. How do we reduce the variation in temperature gain and reduction? Cover our pieces, curing them correctly. So cover, if we're producing a long line double T or a stadium riser form, as soon as we're able, not after lunch or after a long break, as soon as we're able to, we cover the pieces to make sure that the temperature rises and falls at the same rate, no matter how thick or thin the pieces are. Um, we can add an accelerator so all the concrete sped up to the same temperature uh, signature. We can add a retarder so it's all slowed down. And supplementary cementitious materials will help us as well. And um, finally, let's consider some color issues, that of discoloration. So what, what factors affect color in our concrete? Our cementitious, our aggregates, our admixtures, our water content, our patching, our curing process, our finishing and surface texture will affect the color. Everything we do to the mix affects the color. And notice we include curing and batching and placing and finishing. Everybody in your operation affects the color of that concrete. There's no one in there that touches the concrete that doesn't have effect. So the key to color consistency is consistent production process. How about efflorescence? The last uh, troubleshooting I want to come up with. Um, what is efflorescence? This is when uh, salts that exist inside of our concrete um, are exposed to water traveling through our concrete and evaporating from the surface. Well, the salts are soluble, the water brings them to the surface. Well, the water continues evaporating into the environment and deposits the salt on the surface. So we get this white staining, as you see on that picture to the right, the white staining on the surface of the concrete. If you have a brick home, you probably see some efflorescence coming out from the mortar between the brick joints. Um, so that's what's causing it. Conditions we have to be in place in order to experience efflorescence. There have to be soluble salts av available in the concrete, more soluble salts, more potential for efflorescence. There must be a source of water that's in contact with the concrete. And then uh, there must be a pathway for that salt solution to migrate through the concrete. So there's three things that have to be in place for efflorescence to occur. So we, we know what they are, we know how to prevent efflorescence. So uh, how about soluble salts available, high alkali cement? So high alkali cements, more salts available. We can lower our alkalinity of our powder is going to lower the potential for um, um, how a water come in contact with that salt. Well, in early ages, prevent water from, uh, from reaching our concrete. So notice that fluorescence happens more in the spring and fall. That's when typically around America, we have more rain and cooler weather. So the weather has a lot to play with it. So protecting our, our concrete from setting in damp areas. One way to do this too is have uh, airflow. I went to a, a architectural panel plant once that was very proud of their plant panel racking system to where the panels set no more than three quarter inches face to face. So There's very little gap between the panels. They fit a lot of panels in a small space. And they got a ton of efflorescence and our big fix to the mix design, space the panels out three inches instead of three quarter inches. So by spacing all the panels out, they got less panels in the space, but they eliminated efflorescence by allowing airflow across the face of the panel. So evaporating that uh, moisture, not allowing it to set there on the concrete. 
Also, there has to be a pathway for that salt solution to travel through the concrete. How do we reduce that pathway? Reduce our permeability, right? Reduce our water cement ratio. So lower water cement ratios, use of supplementary cementitious materials and low alkali cements can help prevent efflorescence. Also, the darker the color, the more visible it's gonna be. So we expect to see it on blacks and dark browns or reds more than we do on yellows or buffs or white colored uh, tops. So to recap, the uh, two days of, of, uh, of concrete mixes on, how do we get a quality concrete? Well, a lot goes into it. We got all our mixed materials there when we portion them together, how they blend it, how they're mixed or sequenced, the temperature of batching our concrete, the temperature of curing our concrete, our placing and finishing operation, all that goes into getting a quality concrete piece of your plant. Then we got the external forces of sulfates or um, carbonation or any of the impacts from the environment and the internal forces like delayed etching information or ASR and the resistance thereof, um, the durability factors. Once we take all these things into consideration, then we get quality concrete. So quality concrete mixed design is a holistic approach to all these factors, not just the portion. So I'm going to, uh, my email's on the screen now and I'm gonna leave it up there. Um, for anybody to jot down, feel free to email me anytime. Uh, questions, comments, uh, things you don't want to ask now or you think about later, be happy to entertain that with you. Before I do questions, though, I want to go through and I'll come back to the screen so you can write that down. I want to give you one other um, pitch from the Quality Enhancement Committee. One thing we've been working on, that's a quality control-based toolbox talks for your plant. So you're all familiar with safety toolbox talks, probably all your plants are doing them. This is QC-based toolbox talks. Why is there a need for it? Well, with all the new hires and turnover, we find that culture of quality can be impacted when, the, when we're dealing with employee turnover. And we needed a way to address that. How do we keep our culture of quality up in our plants? How do we keep our people trained on quality and quality in the forefront of their mind? It worked for safety, so we created a quality control-based toolbox talks. 24 of which are available now, another six are available very soon. Look at the topics, um, series one, first please, stuff like curing, delayed etching formations, dressing operation, cleaning ducts, handling epoxy rebar, down to my favorite, the third from the bottom, reading a tape measure. Anybody who laughed at that probably has never trained people in a precast plant. Reading a tape measure, series two, Math or pre-stress, right? And how to teach your people percentages and volume, hot weather and cold weather concreting, caring for your form, um, managing aggregate in the batch plant. How does your batch, how does whoever's handling the aggregate in the batch plant ensure quality concrete? Reading a cement mill cert, addressing bug holes, a, a great um, subject matter. And there's a whole series three being released too. Um, interestingly, um, Spanish language versions are available. So series one and two have been translated into Spanish. These are the first Spanish language documents offered by PCI um, and, and their official PCI documents in Spanish, um, both series one and two, working on series three being available in Spanish soon too. How to use them, pick a topic to fit your facility, you give it to your QC manager or leadman or somebody. They go over the toolbox talk, there's a place to be signed and then kept on record with, among your other training records. Yeah, you know, with 24 of them available, do one or two a month or you know, pick one a month that fits your plant process. It keeps quality in the forefront of the minds. Here's my favorite toolbox talk, the Quality Enhancement Committee talk, talk for um, reading a tape measure. See there, step-by-step -step, uh, method for how to read a tape measure. Um, and then on page two of this document, there's three lines where the lead guy giving the presentation can hand a tape measure to his crew and have them measure the line and, and tell them what it is so we can determine how well they are able to read a tape measure and do they need more training. And of course, you see there the place for everyone to sign in so you can keep records of the training. Where do you find these? Go to PCI.org under members only. The sec a tab that says quality assurance resources and then plant toolbox talks. So if you can get on the members only section of PCI.org, you can get these for free. Um, if you don't know the members only password, your plant 
has this. So somebody your plan is how to get these off the uh, internet for you. So all that being said, now's a good time to uh, consider collection. Great job, Paul. Really appreciate it. Uh, while we're waiting for uh, questions that may be coming in and, and uh, such, uh, Billy, do you have uh, any other thoughts that you want to, uh, you'd like to, to share, uh, you know, specifically to our uh, Florida market here? Well, the, the only thing I want to address is Paul calling our sand down here, masonry sand, uh, because <laughs> our effort there's, there's not an FM in Florida that's 2.4 on natural sand, and at least not very much of it. <clears throat> so, um, you, know, it, you know, making uh, self-consolidating concrete in Florida is probably one of the easier states in the country to make self-consolidating concrete. And that's primarily due to the weight of our aggregate. You know, our, our specific gravity running 2.4 to 2.43 uh, is a lighter aggregate, so it uh, is very easy to stay suspended in the mix, uh, unlike uh, granite and things like that uh, that Paul has to deal with up in Georgia. So don't be afraid of doing self-consolidating concrete. Uh, we've done it for quite a few years, probably close to 15 years in Florida now. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, get with your admixture people and, uh, uh, you know, you guys can develop, uh, develop a mix uh, pretty easily uh, for that. The other comment was, you know, from yesterday on when he's talking about cements, I took some notes. Uh, uh, when you're, if you're changing from a type one, type two to a one L cement, you're probably going to see a little bit of, of uh, a water increase in your mix. Either you're going to have to adjust your mix for water or adjust your admixtures to compensate. It's typically a half a gallon to one gallon is what I see here in Florida uh, with the one L cements. Uh, the uh, uh, other thing when uh, you're testing for moistures in our coarse aggregate, I like to use the towel dry weight and not a cookout. And that's primarily due to, 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 to the fluctuation and the absorption of our aggregate could be anywhere from two to six. So if you're using <clears throat> results from the mine on their, uh, on their sheets and uh, you know, you're using an average number and it might be 6% absorption, it might be 2% absorption. So by taking a towel dry weight, you don't have to worry about the absorption of the course of aggregate. Uh, you know, and it's a lot quicker. You don't have to worry about the pieces popping out and when, uh, they're drying out and losing weight that way. So uh, yeah, that, that's just a recommendation. I always like to, and I've always used towel dry weights to. Well, thank you, Billy. I. Um... I thought when you start off with uh, talking about how uh, how uh, long we've been doing SCC down here in Florida and, uh, and how easy it is, I thought you were going to point out uh, the wonderful relationship we have with our uh, state materials office folks and, and with the department and stuff. I thought I did that when I talked about the new specification. <laughs> yeah, that, that we, we worked well together in developing a spec both with the industry and, you know, the, the one thing with the Florida DOT, you know, they'll bring you in and they'll pick your brain and get your ideas and thoughts and, uh, uh, you know, not just, uh, you know, look at it only on their perspective. So, you know, uh, I've always worked well with the DOT and, and uh, you know, they've always been, you know, open-minded as far as looking at the process. They might not agree with you, but... Uh, yeah, they're always open-minded to looking at the process. Great, I really appreciate it. Um, any other questions? So any questions for uh, uh, for Paul or for Billy? 
uh, on uh, on anything that we've discussed or maybe not not yet discussed. Uh, his question says, uh, is it allowed to vibrate SEC mix? So that's a great question. Let's take it from a DOT standpoint. It depends on your DOT. So um, here in Georgia, yes, we can. Virginia produced SEC, yes. That DOT. North Carolina, no. They don't allow vibration of SEC. So oh, the, depends uh, on who uh, you're producing. This, this question come from uh, California. Yeah, so I don't know California. So I would check with your DOT if we're producing for them. If you're not producing DOT concrete, then the answer is much simpler is it's maybe. Um, some did, some SECs are designed to have minimal vibration. Personally, I don't see the point of it. If you got almost there where you need minimal vibration, it's a very short way to no vibration. It'd be great to eliminate vibration from a health and safety aspect as well as for efficiency aspect. So uh, let's take the producing for DOT or a specific customer and just go from a, a best practice of SCC. It'd be great to get all the way there and not need vibration. There is SCC concretes out there that you can vibrate um, without harming them. You should determine what amount of vibration is appropriate for you. It's probably very little. Um, but be aware that introducing dynamic energy to SCC will generate bug holes. So, you may be creating some amount of bug holes by vibrating your SEC. Any last questions for anybody? I see none. I'd like to go ahead and also mention that the, um, uh, when we talk about quality control, the uh, PCI also have the level one and two uh, for the personnel, um, certification as well as level three um uh, recently um through the um uh, the challenges with COVID, uh, a lot of these courses are now available online uh so um so your quality folks you know folks that need to get the certification whether from the department or from our industry or from independent lab uh they can now take some of these courses online if you find a course uh, online through PSI that's, that's full, uh, just let me know, uh, and, and we'll uh, I can reach out to them see if we can get additional classes, or get you in uh, to a class if you really need it. Uh, the uh, the FPCA also offer uh, proctoring of the exam as well. Uh, you know we we see that there's a it's only a need for more qualified people um, uh, in our industry. Uh, for these type of certifications. So if you have any questions, any concern, or you, you're looking for information uh, or looking for uh, proctors, uh, give me a call. Uh, my, my email address I listed yesterday, but you can find them on our website as well, myfpca.org, uh, website, my uh, email and contact information. So with that, any last uh, thought, Paul uh, or Billy, before we wrap things up? No, I just want to thank everybody for their attention. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for participating uh, in the class. And thank you, Paul and Billy, for, um, for sharing your uh, knowledge and, and expertise. Uh, take care.